Okay. <clears throat> and now, I'm going to do my favorite part of the lecture. And this is where I explain action potential by making an analogy to the male orgasm. <laughs> it helps people remember, okay? Okay, so here's the neuron. Here's the cell body with the nucleus. Here's the axon with the myelin and the end feet over here. The neuron, much like the male anatomy, gets excited by stimulation, okay? Stimulation comes into the neuron, stimulation occurs to the male anatomy, it gets excited. When the male or the neuron reaches threshold, it's called the same for both, <laughs> stuff is gonna happen, okay? For the action potential, if you reach threshold, an action potential is going to happen. If the male anatomy reaches threshold, you, an orgasm is going to happen. It's an all or none process. Okay? I, I really seriously want to teach human sexuality, but they haven't given it to me yet, so I don't speak a little bit in here. Oh. <laughs> so we reach threshold, it's going to happen. The action potential fires, an electrical charge jumps down the length of the axon. And the whole point of this process is to eventually get the end feet to release neurotransmitter. So they essentially ejaculate neurotransmitter out of the synapse. <laughs> and at the end of action potential, just like at the end of male orgasm, there's a refractory period in which it would take much more stimulation than the first time to have a second one. Okay? It's called a refractory period for the action potential and for the male. And that's why I compare this to male orgasm and not all orgasms, because we don't have a refractory period. <laughs> <laughs> it's true, though. All right. <laughs> but there's another thing that can make it harder to reach an action potential. And that's hyperpolarization. So yes, there's that period of time in the refractory period where the cell's hyperpolarized, but that's not the only way the cell can get hyperpolarized. Remember how I, okay, you remember the lady in the video said that the neuron can be talking to as many as 10,000 other neurons? Okay, so let's say that um, I'm here in class and I want to really make sure that I am paying attention to what the teacher is saying. And I want to remember the word oligodendrocyte, okay? I'm trying to practice the word oligodendrocyte. I'm trying to get it. And this is the neuron that needs to activate for you to learn the word oligodendrocyte, okay? So this is your oligodendrocyte neuron. You have all other parts of your brain communicating. You have other neurons communicating with this neuron that's opening little sodium gates. And every time it does, it pushes the cell closer to action potential. And if I'm trying really hard to get that word, maybe I have a whole bunch of cells all opening little sodium channels, and sodium is coming in through all these different places. But there are other cells that might be talking to this cell too. And maybe these cells know that you've been drinking. When you've been drinking, and we'll talk about how this happens next time, it opens chloride gates, and chloride comes in. Now, the cell gets more negative. When chloride comes in, the cell gets more negative. So if you've been, that's why you can't remember shit when you're drunk, right? <laughs> because you are having a hard time pushing your cells to action potential because <coughs> the alcohol is making these chloride gates open. That's also why you like to pass out and die and stuff. <laughs> Let's not talk about that, right? Okay. And then I want to talk briefly about saltatory conduction. 
So I've already explained what saltatory conduction is, but I want to talk a little bit more about it. When the charge reaches negative 55 at the axon hillock and the gates all fly open, all the sodium gates fly open, and sodium rushes into the cell, it gets very positive right there at the axon hillock. And then that charge jumps across the myelin. Because myelin doesn't conduct electricity, it just shoots it forward. And then the gates here open, and the charge gets positive here, bless you. And then these, then the charge jumps, and then these gates open, and so on and so forth, all the way down the length of the axon. The charge jumps down the length of the axon. Yes? So is the myelin sheet not, is not covering unconfused? It's like the myelin sheet, just like a little thing that's on the axon, and then there's like a space. Yes, exactly right. There's spaces all down the length. That's exactly right. Space, space, space. Exactly. So like that part of the axon is just exposed. Yes. Okay. And that part is called a node of Ranvier. They're called the nodes of Ranvier, the exposed areas in between the myelin. Because Ranvier discovered them. So he gets to name them. So he is the one who figured out how myelin and what it does. And so it makes sense that if MS, multiple sclerosis, attacks this, first of all, you're going to get miscommunication in between nearby neurons. And that's one of the things that happens, one of the symptoms. You have this miscommunication. But also, it's going to make it so that the action potential doesn't travel as quickly. It has to open up this gate, then this gate, then this gate, then da 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 all the way down and that's much slower. The pieces of myelin are actually evolved to be the perfect size because if they were any shorter, transmission would occur more slowly. But if they were any longer, the electrical impulse would die before it got to the next node. So they're exactly the right size. Saltatory conduction, you know, by Spanish speakers, saltolerana, the frog jumps, right? Jumping, because the electrical charge jumps. Salta is the same in Latin as it is in Spanish. Okay, so here's a little tiny, really quick video just illustrating that actually happening. The improved efficiency is due to the fact that the insulation provided by certain cells, called Schwann cells, which have wrapped themselves around each axon effectively, limits the movement of ions to short segments between these cells. Okay, so this said Schwann cell. So are we in the peripheral nervous system or the central nervous system? Yeah. Rather than allowing this ion exchange to take place along the entire length of the nerve fiber. Loss of the myelin sheet can cause serious impairment of function of the nerves involved. Okay, so I, I want to pause it efficiency. just a second to, to remind you then that if we were to cut right here, if we were to cut this axon right here, because these are Schwann cells in the peripheral nervous system, they will make a pathway for that axon to regrow. at the very end of the action potential. What's the point of all this? Okay, the electrical signal jumps down the length of the axon until it gets to the end feet. What happens at the end feet? This. When the action potential reaches the end feet, when that charge reaches the end feet, it opens calcium channels that are embedded in the end feet. Okay, so there are calcium channels that are also voltage-gated. And when the voltage gets to, the, to where they are, they open. Calcium comes into the cell, and what calcium does is it causes these vesicles, they are like bubbles, these vesicles, these containers, to fuse with the cell membrane. And these vesicles contain neurotransmitters. Neurotransmitters are molecules created by your brain that fill these vesicles 
And when the calcium comes in and the vesicles bind to the input, the neurotransmitter gets excreted, you know, barked out, into the synapse. Synapse means space. Synapse is the space in between two neurons. At first, it's so small, the synapse is so small that at first we didn't even know it existed. Golgi, remember he has the Golgi stain named after him and Golgi bodies named after him? He thought that they were actually connected. It was uh, Cajal that discovered that there was actually a, a tiny space. Yes? Because of the synapse space between two neurons. And that's where the neurotransmitter gets released at the end of action potential. And that action potential then is over. That's the end of the action potential for that cell. Because this is the synapse, this cell is called the presynaptic neuron. It's before the synapse. Because this cell is after the synapse, it's called the postsynaptic cell, or the postsynaptic neuron, just the one after. So our, the sender is the presynaptic, and the receiver is the postsynaptic. 